Hello and welcome to Dialogue. Leaders from the 19 G20 member countries plus the African Union and the European Union are calling for cooperation on climate change, poverty reduction and tax policy while also highlighting human suffering in the ongoing conflicts. They met in Brazil for a two-day summit to tackle a series of global challenges. So what progresses have been made and what changes can we expect in the following year? And can G20 a cooperation fend off risks brought about by geopolitical uncertainties? Join us for the discussion today live from Beijing. I'm Xu Qinduo. Joining me today are Professor Liu Bocheng at the University of International Business and Economics, Otto Viano uh, Canuto, Senior Re uh, Fellow from Policy Center for the New South and former Vice President of the World Bank, Ben Norton, founder and editor of Geopolitical Economy Report, and Arena Muresen, Senior Researcher from the Institute for Global Dialogue. Welcome to Dialogue. I will start with uh, Otto Viano, since you are based in um, where, actually, the G20 summit, and tell us, what's your takeaway? My takeaway, it's a pleasure to be here again, is that at least we had a declaration this time because uh, more recently uh, it has not always been possible. And the fact of the matter is that despite the attempt by, uh, by Argentina's president to block uh, uh, some of the references there, at least the message coming from the meeting is the need to have some concerted action uh, in the world by, by the leaders of the world on towards uh, building uh, a just world in the sustainable planet. And, uh, and, and this is quite important as we are, as we all know, at a moment very delicate when it comes to the, the geopolitical relations among members uh, of the G20. And at least the, uh, the common acknowledgement of uh, the need to have uh, a movement in that direction, at least that's the only good news. Uh, the, the G20 is not a deliberative. Uh, institution, so it does not take decisions, uh, operational decisions on on uh, to uh, to the members and so on. But uh, since its inception, since its its uh, it beginning, uh, occasionally it serves as a as a means of coordination and uh, facilitating the joint action in directions. So let's hope that, uh, despite the opposition to the tax on the on the rich that at least uh, occasionally we might have some convergence uh, years on, on on doing something that regard. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Arena, just as uh, Otto Viano pointed out, uh, of course, uh, I mean, G20 is not uh, the place where it has the power to implement whatever decision there or to force its members to do this and that. It's really about the cooperation exchanges here. Uh, some say, you know, with a, with, with a sigh of relief uh, that at least we reached an agreement. Uh, we have a joint statement on those, um, in a sense, controversial topics, you know, climate change, poverty reduction, and of course, tax the rich. Uh, what, what's, uh, how do you look at that? Absolutely, thank you for the question. Thank you for having me here again. You're welcome. And again, it's, a, it's an informal grouping that discusses global economic coordination and cross-border challenges that advance climate and sustainable development goals aiming to strengthen multilateralism. As, broad as that is. But here, Brazil had to balance a very progressive agenda. And as we know, some discussions are easier to have than others. And some discussions we also take for granted where it's easier to move the needle. And so before you know it, um, you might actually be able to see some kind of incremental progress over 10 years. So if I think of an example, I remember thinking to uh, the Seoul uh, presidency in 2010, and the goal was to create greater financial inclusion. And the metric here, you know, was to look at how many adults have now access to a bank account. And these are things we take for granted. And so the, these are examples as well where the G20 has potential, you know, to make a very real impact on the lives of people. But in building a sustainable planet, I think what's worth noteworthy here is that not, not everyone is able to have a discussion 
And so for me, it's more about the practical role of the G20, whereby they facilitate dialogue amid geopolitical tensions by reminding various actors of the broader implications, perhaps puzzling through, you know, a number of solutions, but being able to offer that platform as well. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Ben, of course, I mean, this is uh, um, the largest economist in the world. Uh, the head of uh, the economist, you know, got together and talk about uh, the global issues. Of course, global governance is important. Uh, and then it touches some point this uh, uh, so reform in the UN, in particular UN Security Council, and also, uh, you know, as the President Xi Jinping pointed out, of course, they touch upon the issues of the WTO, you know, World Bank, IMF. Basically, representation, uh, I would say, imbalanced representation from the global south. And WTO, of course, we see a paralysis because um, of, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the problem, let's say, or, um, or opposition from the U.S. It, you know, th that's, uh, you know, impeding the progress or the normal development of global trade. Um, how important are those issues? Well, they're very important. And this is also why the G20 is such an interesting forum, because you can have some of these countries that come together that might have these, you know, very significant disagreements and conflicts, and they can potentially discuss ways of trying to resolve them. I mean, what we're really saying is that when we look at the problems like the paralysis in the WTO, the lack of representation in the IMF and the World Bank, what we really can see is that these organizations that are supposed to be multilateral are not truly multilateral. So I think China's played an important role in helping in other countries as well. Brazil has been very active on this, India as well, in promoting more multilateralism. And the most important thing, especially when we're talking about the Bretton, Bretton Woods institutions, is that, that the global south needs more representation. You also mentioned the UN Security Council. You know, the Security Council was designed in a particular way in 1945, at a time when much of the world was still colonized. This is the end of World War II. And, you know, we have countries like France and the UK, which have a relatively small population, around 70 million people, and yet you don't have a permanent membership for some of the most populous countries on earth, like India, Bangladesh, Nigeria, Brazil itself. So that's a larger symptom of this, that's a smaller symptom of a larger problem, which is the lack of representation for the Global South. We can also see that in the IMF and the World Bank, where for the entire history of these organizations, they have been run by an American and by a European. So every single World Bank president has been American. Every IMF managing director has been a European. And if you look at, for instance, voting rights in these organizations, the US has veto power and the G7 countries have much more representation in terms of their vote share than many of the Global South countries, like the BRICS countries, which have a larger and larger share of the global economy. So clearly we need more multilateralism and more representation. Mm -hmm. So, Bo Chen, in a sense, you know, if we can fix the problem of imbalance or the lack of the voice from the Global South, for example, or if we can fix the problem of WTO, I mean, basically, these, these are efforts to safeguard um, the, the current status quo or the global order. Is that the sense? I mean, you tell us, you know, me, you are a trade expert. Uh, how important it is to fix the WTO problem um, for, let's say, continuation of this multilateral trading system for a lot of countries, you know, like Brazil, China, most of the G20 countries, I would say. Yes, uh, I think it's really an embarrassment, if uh, not a shame. We are heading uh, way into the 21st century. We are still talking about hunger and poverty when fewer and fewer people are really engaged in uh, the agricultural business. And uh, when uh, many people in the global now are really uh, having difficulty in choosing what type of delicacies they can enjoy and uh, the basic access of uh, food uh, is still a problem. The other issue is that now there are so many forums and so many uh, opportunities for uh, leaders to get together and people are still talking about a barbarian uh, way of conquering the other's uh, uh, territory. Uh, so. Uh, this is really something that, uh, you know, the uh, leaders need to reflect on. And now the uh, G20 represents the largest economy. And now uh, you are talking about the governance, and this is really the key issue. So uh, first, the more of the representation uh, from the global south needs to be uh, uh, urgently addressed. 
And the other is that uh, the uh, global platform and particularly rules need to be further reinforced uh, to be able to facilitate the uh, free flow of trade and investment because uh, for, for centuries, uh, you know, uh, from Adam Smith to David Ricardo and uh, now to um, uh, many theories. So the uh, time and again, it has been proven that a uh, uh, trade barrier uh, represented by the protectionism is really harmful to uh, not only the neighbors, but eventually to themselves. Mm -hmm. But we do see uh, there is a disappointing divergence around the world and uh, a big some of the big economies are retreating. Uh, from the uh, global forum and uh, a shorter, sh uh, shrugging off uh, their uh, responsibility. So, therefore, uh, you know, the, we hope that uh, regional integration can really replace uh, some of the uh, impasses that WTO uh, is uh, facing so that uh, uh, G uh, G20 in particular can really uh, play a more important role, not only by proposing initiatives or mm -hmm. uh, uh, declarations, which are still important, but uh, uh, you know, bring up some concrete measures and the rule enforcement uh, towards the uh, free flow of all economic factors across the border, particularly in view of uh, today's digital economy and also the collective challenge mm -hmm. that we are facing well, with the climate change. Well, uh, let me bring you uh, out to Vienna. You know, you were the former uh, World Bank, uh, and of course you, are, you have been evolving in this trade and banking uh, sector for a long time. Uh, now here, you know, we, we, uh, as I said, as uh, President Xi said, that we need to urgently restore the normal functioning of the dispute settlement mechanism as soon as possible. I, I understand that there are tariffs, for example, uh, U.S. against China, for example, EU against China, and uh, uh, etc. People are worried about the globalization or the continuity of globalization. Uh, so what are the disagreements? Is there a way to, say, reach some uh, compromise, to make some concessions so we can continue <laughs> to carry forward those reforms, those, uh, those mechanisms? Uh, that's, a, that's the uh, a tough call in the sense that uh, clearly the world has been retrenching into more protectionism and, and uh, a departure from the globalization period, during which, as we all know, uh, more than one billion people on the planet uh, left poverty because of trade integration and so on. But the fact of the matter is that uh, since the, the bottom of the income pyramid in, in some of the advanced economies did not benefit uh, as much as maybe their elites and so on, there has been this creeping up of a, a movement, anti-sentiment, anti-globalization, that has expressed itself in the kind of policies that have been followed in, in uh, some advanced countries. In the case of the U.S., the victory of uh, platforms like the one uh, pursued by Mr. Trump. Uh, so it's a tough call. Uh, for the time being, uh, it, uh, I guess the aspiration uh, should be to live with, to to keep it uh, to the extent of possible within some limits, uh, avoiding uh, radicalization. With respect to democratic institutions, let me just say uh, something. Uh, I, I've had a, a long career and uh, as uh, a, uh, being a vice president at the World Bank, as well as in other moments, a member of the board, and I've also was a member of the board uh, of the IMF uh, and a vice president at the Inter-American Development Bank. So I know these beasts from inside, from all angles. Uh, a major uh, difficulty is the following. Uh, by any, any uh, measurement of uh, what should be the shares of the countries in the, in the uh, uh, participation of the capital of these institutions, the World Bank, take the World Bank, uh, the, the configuration of shares should be different from what it is now. To give a, a glaring example, uh, uh, China uh, should have something close to 10% of the capital of the World Bank, uh, whereas currently it is still, since the last capital increase, a 6%. Uh, and so the point is that the climate change agenda uh, the ramping up of, uh, of, act of, uh, of activities by these institutions with respect as well 
to the, the traditional sustainable government goals, we'll need a ramping up of the capital of these institutions. But uh, this ramping up of capital of institutions will have to reflect, let's say, the structure of the global economy as it is now. That's, that's going to be a major challenge uh, uh, that I hope uh, a compromise can be found again. Mm -hmm. uh, but for sure, we don't have uh, an appropriate, uh, inadequate uh, representation in terms of voice and in terms of uh, participation in the capital of these institutions, uh, take into account, let's say, the, the underlying parameters uh, of the global economy. That's, that's something to be paid attention to. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, just as um, you mentioned, the climate change, uh, uh, Ben, you know, just, just like a problem, the global governance, there are differences uh, <laughs> between the global south from this developed world. Uh, you see climate finance, of course, we have this COP29 ongoing in Azerbaijan and uh, representatives are calling the G20 leaders, uh, you know, to make a decision so they can uh, reach an agreement by the end of it, by the end of this week, uh, actually. Uh, so. Uh, where are we now? You know, we know the focus is about the climate finance. Uh, seems the rich countries uh, obviously disagree with uh, the poorer developing countries in terms of how much, in terms of how uh, they can find, uh, fund their uh, efforts to alleviate the climate change effects. Yeah, well, we've seen that, that the advanced countries that develop through em carb emitting carbon, uh, they have actually not uh, followed the promises that they've made. They have not kept those promises to provide financing to developing countries. And we should keep in mind, you know, you, we constantly hear, um, for instance, authorities in the U.S. or in some uh, European countries will complain that China and now India are major emitters. But we should look at, first of all, historical emissions and also per capita emissions. Countries like China and India have four times the population each of the United States. Still today, the United States is the world's largest per capita emitter, and that's not considering the historical emissions. So the rich countries that developed through burning lots of coal and oil have a historical responsibility to provide financing and opportunities to Global South countries. And you know, when we say Global South, I think we should emphasize that we're talking about the global majority. The Global North only represents about 14% of the world population. So we're talking about the majority of the world population in many of these countries that still are developing, they still need to lift their people out of poverty. That's going to mean that they need energy, um, a country like India that is still very much developing. And the burden should not be on the countries that are developing to solve the problem that was largely caused by the countries that are already developed. I think it's very reasonable to expect more financing for the global south, the global majority. And it's unfortunate that there's so much resistance. And unfortunately, I think it's only going to get worse now that we see Mr. Trump returning to the White House and saying, drill, baby, drill. So you are not optimistic, obviously, either for this current um, expectation for the result. And then even we have an agreement, uh, its implementation. Yeah, well, um, there's also a hesitancy always we see with many of these agreements, even with the Paris Accord, there's a hesitancy to make any of these agreements binding. So even if we do see, for instance, the Biden administration or a European administration, if they agree to a deal, you can have someone like Mr. Trump come back and simply say that they're not going to abide by it. So I think we need more serious commitments. OK, there's a tech a connection here there. Uh, Rina, uh, you know, climate change, and of course, it's a finance is important. That's that's uh, the funding is important for developing nations. Uh, uh, let's share with us what some of you say from South uh, Africa. You know, how do they look at the issue and what we need to do uh, so we can all move forward in fighting climate change? Thank you for the question. And since South Africa is taking over this baton of hosting G20 next year, much of the agenda really focuses on how does it bring in the just energy transition, number one, into creating a sustainable environment for citizens, bringing a, in a just economy, essentially. And so it plans on carrying through much of what the Brazilian presidency has already discussed in terms of environmental action, in terms of um, also creating the synergy within the trade and investment area or uh, topics rather. And so what South Africa is aiming to do as well is, is really interpret this as 
in the context of what African countries are experiencing. And if we take this back to what the international kind of milieu is and how these rules came about, they came about usually, you know, because of the success of multilateral organizations like the WTO, its ability to mitigate, you know, these kinds of disputes and enforce rules with um, changing geopolitical interests and the rise of nationalism and populism, as we've seen, we we see a very active shrinking space for multilateralism and perhaps, you know, to assert uh, an extent to the preference for regionalism. And so you have this, this re-emphasis on the role of what the region, what the continent should play. And so bringing in the African Union to next year's uh, engagement. South Africa really wants to have an African G20 at the same time. It wants to be committed to these broader African um, agenda points as well, which brings in environmental action. And what we're seeing quite a bit is while the African Union has this intention to also bring through discussions on peace development, and uh, especially in areas like non-tariff barriers, it reminds the G20 of what it means to share the world uh, with your neighbors that have significantly less than you do. And some of these G20 members are, of course, incredibly aware. However, some are not. And it's unclear to what extent the global south is going to be able to have uh, a catalytic sorry, a catalytic powerful change in the immediate term, but it does speak to the grit that it has, you know, to become this engine for self growth. Mm. So it's interesting to see the urgency in which a number of gains need to be uh, kind of brought to the fold before the 2026 presidency of the G20, which actually goes back to the US. Mm -hmm. uh, well, let's move on to uh, another issue and a topic, of course, um, you know, a priority actually for the hosting country, uh, Brazil. Uh, Bolton, earlier you mentioned about, you know, poverty uh, and the hunger, you know, it's a pity, it's a shame. 21st century, we're still talking about, um, you know, basically, according to the UN, it's uh, 733 million people who went hungry in 2023. I mean, how do you characterize the, the fact, the reasons, you know, why, uh, you know, even today uh, with such advanced technology, well, there are still such a, uh, I would say, large proportion of human being, I mean, still ha in hungry. <laughs> If we make a, such a calculation, the, the world has plenty of food and they have plenty of technologies to, uh, to deal with food. And we have the uh, better way logistically to deliver the food, but why people are deprived of such is not really those people who are not really making the efforts, but it is really the unfair uh, level playing fields around the world. And uh, many rich countries, they are myopic and uh, now also uh, with the uh, geopolitical tensions that is going on, the uh, food supply or the corridor have been blocked time and again. And then there are also multinationals who are really taking advantage, uh, you know, in a marketing sense by uh, playing oligopoly or monopoly in that regard, so that uh, they raise the price uh, for uh, uh, such a high level that uh, those people could not really afford it. And uh, then also the technology uh, is there, but uh, you know, there is, it is so much more pr protective uh, uh, in terms of growing the uh, crops, in terms of the, from seeding to uh, the delivery uh, of uh, the uh, machine tools uh, for harvestation, etc. So that's also uh, being blocked. And uh, the other, of course, is domestic governance. And there has been, you know, uh, lousy governance in some of the countries and the, uh, the rich are really uh, there to take a big portion of their social wealth so that, uh, you know, there is no, not really accumulated capital to support the uh, virtuous feedback uh, over the production power. So mm -hmm. those are really the issues that need to be addressed on the global issues and uh, particularly, you know, with G20 as the most powerful uh, economies gather, gathering together, they can really talk about this and how we can really do this. You know, those countries uh, who are really suffering from poverty, they do not really need a, a simply showing a begging bowl for a dime. 
but they need sustainable way of growing their own crops and also by uh, having a fair price mechanism yes. uh, to be able to exchange with the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. But that's not available so far. Um, well, uh, of course, you know, and related to that, uh, you know, the, um, uh, on our agenda is uh, uh, tax the super rich. Um, that's also the proposal, of course, uh, made by Brazil. Uh, out of Vienna, so... But after you tax the super rich, how the money is going to be really channeled mm -hmm. to support uh, they, those who are really uh, in right. bad shape needing? So mm -hmm. this is another question that follows. Yeah, uh, Otto Vienna, so uh, Vienna, what's the, the idea how we will move forward by taxing the, the rich and help the poor? See, uh, I understand that uh, we only had uh, tentatively a signal given by the G20 this time, but ultimately a uh, mechanism would have to be found and commitments by uh, the, the G20 countries to transfer part of uh, of the resource obtained through that taxation to some sort of a global funds. Because everything we're talking about uh, is to be implemented through joint initiatives. The multilateral institutions that we have today, the IMF, World Bank, they are uh, joint efforts. They are the result uh, of, uh, of, of uh, countries putting together uh, sums of capital and so on. So, in a similar fashion, uh, eventually part of the tax collection, if something like this go, uh, goes forward, would be to be transferred to initiatives, whoever be the institutions responsible for the management of the resource, uh, uh, be it for against hunger, be it uh, other initiatives alike. Uh, the taxation, the cross-border taxation, is a key issue, as we all know, because many companies have uh, seized the opportunity, the possibilities of uh, doing tax arbitrage to skip from uh, yes. from taxation in their right. own countries. And, uh, and this initiative That's... went forward in the last few years, but it has not become concrete. So it is related as well. Is it related? Uh, uh, also related, uh, Ben. I would say, you know, in terms of a poverty reduction, uh, of course, one country standing out as China. Um, you know, if you look at the Chinese uh, uh, policies or, or what they do, uh, you know, as the presidency mentioned uh, during the meeting, uh, talked about uh, you know, FOCAC cooperation with Africa, talked about the Belt and Road Initiative, and the Global Development Initiative. <laughs> you see, the Chinese stress on development development and they have a belief development will solve the problem, either hunger or poverty here. Tell us your understanding of that. Yeah, it I think is it's true. absolutely uh, right. I mean, China yeah, has shown yeah. that it can lift 800 million people out of poverty. Uh, let's not forget that in the past 40 years, according to the World Bank, three quarters of all global poverty reduction have been thanks to China. So, I mean, um, China has shown that you can develop, you can lift your people out of poverty if you have, if you plan, if you have a concerted project, and if you also have the financing. And, and for many developing countries, that's the real problem is getting the financing. So in that sense, China has provided a very important opportunity through the Belt and Road Initiative. We just saw that President Xi was in Peru opening the, this historic mega port um, that is really going to help transform Latin America economically, help to integrate further with other parts of the global south not only for China and Latin America, but for other parts of Asia, of course, because now Latin America can help export some of its products to other countries in Asia. Asia has many of the fastest growing economies in the world. I mean, if you have more mm -hmm. interconnectedness through this infrastructure, through yes. ports, through well, railroads, time, through, if you also have infrastructure limit, like we schools have and hospitals, there, this is what you need to actually develop. Yeah, with that, we conclude today's show. Many thanks to our guests. You can also watch us on CDHN app on YouTube. I'm Xu Qinduo. Thanks for being with us. See you next time.